Hey folks, I'm back covering uh, my games from the 2021 National Open from Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, this was my round eight game, so the first of two uh, final day games that I played. And this game I'm playing against Grandmaster uh, Nicholas Cheka, who is a really strong junior player, uh, now up to 25-74 fide. And uh, yeah, definitely a very, very tough uh, opponent. Uh, fortunately for me, I actually had some really decent prep for this game. And I was able to just get like a really comfortable position uh, out of the opening. And I'll kind of take you guys through it. So it starts off with uh, d4, d5, c4. He goes for the Slav, which I was uh, definitely expecting. It's kind of been his main opening for a few years now. Uh, and here I decided to play knight c3. Uh, black goes knight f6 and e3. So there are a couple of points um, of this move order compared to the more typical way. Um, the white often starts with knight f3. Um, basically, white can start with either knight move and uh, and then play e3. Um, if you develop both knights, for example, knight f3, knight c3, here black gets quite a few options. Of course, there's uh, the semi-slav, there's the chebanenko with a6, um, and then there's also just the classical main line with d takes c4, which is generally considered uh, very, very solid for black. Um, so for this game, I wanted to play some kind of e3 setup. Um, because my opponent, he doesn't really play a lot of semi-slav as far as I saw, although I would be uh, okay to go into that. Um, but instead I noticed that he plays um, quite a, a few, uh, he had quite a few games with uh, the line a6, knight f3, and then bishop f5 uh, in this position. Um, and so this was actually the main thing that I was um, preparing for. Um, but then during the game, you know, he started thinking early on, I guess he figured, you know, maybe I prepped or something, I'm not really sure. Um, but after knight of three here, he ends up playing b5, which is, of course, one of the absolute main moves in the position, uh, just as far as I knew. Um, I don't think he had uh, too much experience in this one. Um, nevertheless, I was prepared for this line as well, so I played b3. Uh, now black plays bishop g4. Important move to develop the bishop um, before playing e6 here. Um, one point I want to quickly mention is that one of the advantages of starting with knight c3 here is that this line bishop f5 is not quite as solid for black as when white instead played knight f3 earlier. So here the difference is white can take on d5 and uh, play queen to b3. And basically it's better for white to have this knight developed here compared to this one um, because here white is putting pressure on d5 and black doesn't have like a move queen b6, for example, to defend the b pawn, because then white takes on d5. Just quickly put that on the board. And then after queen takes b3, white throws in knight takes f6 check and uh, wins a pawn in the end. So in the game, we get e6, knight f3. Now bishop f5 is considered uh, very solid because queen b3 um, is actually met with this funny move rook a7, um, where yeah, black definitely has good chances of, of fighting for equality. Um, but in the game, like I mentioned, black played b5, b3, bishop g4. And uh, now I play this move a4. I think this move caught my opponent off guard a little bit because he definitely started spending some time here. The main move generally in this position has been to play bishop e2. And uh, that's also a solid line. Or white just castles, plays bishop b2. And uh, eventually white just tries to put a little bit of pressure on the c file. The point is, is that it's hard for black to take a bunch of times on c4 because uh, c6 pawn and a6 pawn will be left isolated. Um, but from white's point of view, once the rook gets to c1, you know, white can take on d5 at any moment and then try to fight for play uh, on the c file. So it's kind of an interesting structure uh, for white to go into. Um, but here I played this move a4 and I got this idea actually from uh, Grandmaster Sam Shanklin's course on chessable. He has like a three-part course on playing 1d4, and I'd never seen this idea before then, so uh, I definitely uh, want to credit Sam for, for this one. It's a pretty interesting move, and although I do think um, black certainly can equalize here as well, like after um, bc4, bc4, knight d7, I think black gets good chances uh, playing for e5 and can get some counterplay. It is kind of a nice surprise weapon if uh, the opponent is not familiar with this line. Um, as after the move b4 played in the game, I actually think white does get uh, very decent chances for, for an edge after this move knight to e2. Um, so this is what ends up happening. And of course, from black's point of view, b4 is a very logical move. Black usually doesn't want to take on c4 and, and leave himself with some weaknesses here, but I think that's the way they have to play. After b4 knight e2, 
Um, the point is that white breaks this pin and threatens to move knight to e5 and trying to uh, chase down uh, black's bishop. So if something like e6 here, white goes knight e5, and eventually the bishop kind of gets, uh, gets caught. White wins the bishop pair and uh, is doing pretty well. Um, if black takes on f3, which is certainly possible, then after gf3, the idea is that these double pawns are really not that bad for white. The bishop will go to g2, white will castle, push e4, and eventually just build up a, a big center. Definitely a playable position for black, but I was um, kind of looking forward to, to playing this one because I do like white's chances here. Um, and I, I don't think black uh, fully equalizes here. Um, but in the game, black goes knight d7, which is a very natural move, but I would say actually probably a pretty serious inaccuracy because white just goes 95 anyway and uh, the point is that this bishop is under attack if black backs up like let's say um, bishop h5 or something i think white can play a move like queen to c2 uh, just unpinning and then eventually uh, playing like knight f4 and, and tracking down the bishop anyway um, there might be other moves that white can play here uh, as well that are, are reasonable um, that's kind of what i was thinking during the game and after black takes on e5 which is what was played d takes e5, the problem is the knight on f6 is hanging, and the pawn on d5 is potentially hanging as well. So if black plays uh, knight d7 here, for example, um, white can take on d5, and black can't really recapture, because queen takes d5, white just wins a pawn here, and uh, if knight takes e5, during the game I was considering different things, but strongest it seems, uh, just simple move bishop b2. Just like attacking the knight, the knight is defending the c6 pawn, so it's kind of awkward here for black already. Definitely doesn't want to make a move like f6, and yeah, essentially I think white is just getting a pretty big initiative right off the bat. Um, so after knight e5, my opponent kind of went into the tank for a little bit, and he ends up coming up with knight takes c5, d takes e5, and he throws in bishop takes e2 in this position. Uh, I think mainly so that the bishop wouldn't be kind of hanging on g4 in, in all those positions and being somewhat of a target. Um, so now at this point, I'm, I'm fully out of book. I go bishop takes e2, and here black comes in with knight to e4. And so here we see why the bishop needed to be exchanged, is so that white doesn't play f3 in this position, as would happen if black had played um, knight e4, you know, without trading, then just f3 and, and white wins a piece. So takes, takes, knight to e4. And here I started spending some time because I realized, you know, I have some options here. I have the two bishops, so I was already feeling very good about my chances. Um, but, of course, you know, black has a solid position and wants to go e6, develop the bishop, castle, and, yeah, basically just, just get everything out. So this was the moment where I was really strongly considering this move uh, e6, which is a thematic pawn sacrifice. In fact, I was even considering taking here with the queen so that on knight e4 I could play e6, and on fe6, I would have this idea, queen h5 check, let's say g6, queen e5. And then I'm hitting the rook, and I'm hitting this pawn. If I'm able to just win the pawn back, then black's position is left with a lot of weaknesses, and I think white is generally doing really, really well. Um, but ultimately, I wasn't sure about this one. I mean, it felt very strange, you know, to put the queen on e2, kind of uh, blocking the bishop. I thought maybe black can even play queen d6 here, and... You know, ef7, king f7, I don't think is actually such a big deal uh, for black's king because black has a solid center and can develop quickly. Um, so I end up deciding to just take with the bishop, just play the natural move, knight e4. And here, once again, I was definitely considering e6 here. And the point after fe6 would be to just play like bishop b2, pin the pawn on the diagonal so that it's actually very hard for black to develop the dark square bishop. And if black has to go like rook g8 here just to play g6, then of course the king is never really going to be uh, fully safe in this position. So in the game, like I fully believed that you know white should have good compensation here. I just didn't know like how much and whether it's you know a better position than if I just play like simple move bishop b2 and just play for the two bishops. Because I also felt like in this position, you know, I'm going to play rook c1, queen c2, uh, maybe bishop d4 somewhere, and then eventually take on d5 and just kind of dominate um, the c file. So just as like a sample line, let's say e6, castles, you know, bishop e7, rook c1, castles, queen to c2. I felt like this kind of structure would be very unpleasant for black. I'm going rook fd1 here, I might take at some point and kind of invade queen c6, queen c7. An a6 pawn is always kind of a, a target in the future uh, for my bishop. If black pushes that to a5, 
you know, the pawn is going to be weak one day anyway, and then the bishop, the light square bishop, is going to be really strong. So I definitely felt like I would have a very clear edge with something like this, which is why, like, I wasn't really sure whether I should risk it um, with e6. Um, mainly just because I, I wasn't fully sure on how to uh, follow up, you know, on, on the sacrifice. Like, I understand I have compensation after bishop to b2, but what exactly is the plan here? I'm not really sure. Um, you know, after the game, I analyzed it, of course, and now I do wish I, I would have gone for this one, because objectively, it is kind of the strongest move and, and it poses a lot of problems for black. And the idea is that, okay, you know, white just castles and you don't really have to do anything special. You just basically develop your pieces like in the other line. And the argument is that black's position, you know, black's quality of life is much lower than in the previous position where there's equal material. Meaning that the extra pawn is just not that useful for black here. Um, one idea I didn't quite anticipate was that if black plays a move like knight c3 here, um, then it's important for white to play queen to d4. With the idea that, again, we're making it very hard uh, for black to develop by pinning the g-pawn. Uh, we don't care about taking on f7 because then, you know, black just uh, gets to develop easier in that case. And if black takes on e2, okay, white is just playing king takes e2, and white's king is not really in any danger here. The rook is coming to d1, bishop b2, rook ac1, all of white's pieces get into the game, and white gets, uh, again, very, very nice uh, initiative in, in this position. Um, I think black might have to play queen d6, uh, objectively. And then after something like bishop to b2, um, if queen takes e6, this is definitely not something I would have considered during the game. I would assume that, you know, I should just take. But the engine points out that you can even sacrifice the pawn without damaging black structure, just in the interest of forcing black to spend a lot of time, right? One tempo to play queen d6, one tempo to play queen takes e6, and then black kind of owes us another tempo to move the queen and develop e6, bishop e7. So uh, apparently, the, you know, the time it takes for black to develop all this is, of course, worth it for, for the pawn. And it kind of goes back to that principle of, like, a pawn is generally worth around three tempi. You know, if you win three tempi from the opponent by giving up a pawn, it's kind of considered uh, a fair trade, like you're getting enough for it. And indeed, the way white can continue here is to take on d5, castle, um, let's say black, you know, I was thinking maybe goes rook to g8 here. If black drops back with uh, the queen, I think white um, can again continue like bishop d3 or rook c1 or bishop f3 or uh, queen d4 I think is also interesting. And basically white gets a, a lot of play in the time that it takes for black to go e6. And it's important to point out that even when black goes e6 and the bishop comes out, well, the g7 pawn is always going to be hanging, so it's not like black can just uh, necessarily develop for, for free here. So, long story short, uh, there was full compensation here for white. Objectively, I should have gone for it. During the game, I wasn't totally sure, so I decided to kind of play it safe. But uh, now I know, and hopefully next time I get a similar looking position. Of course, this e6 sack is very thematic. Hopefully, I'm able to actually convince myself uh, to go for it. So, bishop e2. Uh, black played e6, uh, I decided to castle, and I was definitely considering a move um, like knight c3 here, and my idea was to just play queen c2 and just kind of ignore the knight. Well, for one, I'm threatening to now take, whereas if I had taken first and then gone here, then bishop b4 just defends the pawn, and I wasn't really sure how I'm going to uh, play around this one. So I was thinking queen c2, and then if black takes on e2, I'll go queen takes e2, and from afar, I mean, this, this position, again, looked very, very pleasant. Rooks come to the center. I'm going to play e4 at some point. And the threat would be to just eventually leave black with an isolated pawn on d5. That would be super, super weak. Um, but according to Stockfish, apparently black can just take on c4, queen takes, and go queen to d5 here. And with black's pawn coming to c5 next, like let's say rook c1, black can just take and push c5. Apparently white doesn't actually have much here. Even though I'm ahead in development, it's actually very difficult for me to activate my bishop. You know, if I had an extra move to play bishop d4, then I think white would be doing really well because I can just pile up on the c-pawn. Um, but after c5, it turns out white doesn't really have, have much in this kind of structure. So that was kind of instructive for me because I did think white would be better there. As it happened, uh, black decided to play queen to a5 which I kind of understand because he's supporting uh, a future knight to c3, and he's also kind of fighting for the c5 square. Um, so here I played rook to c1, and uh, once again, if knight to c3, the idea was to just go queen c2, threatening to take the pawn, and if takes, queen takes c2. Again, during the game, I believe that white should have uh, a decent advantage here. 
Um, instead, black played bishop to e7, and now I play queen to c2. And yeah, during the game, now that c3 is covered, um, I was kind of expecting knight c5 here. It's important to note, I, I have a small trap. If black plays castles, then I just go bishop d3. And either I'm winning a pawn on e4, or I'm winning the h7 pawn. And actually, black just doesn't have a good response here. If f5, then we take on passant. And uh, if knight takes f6, for example, we can just take this one, take on h7. And not only do we win a pawn, we won a pawn around black's king. So it looked like, you know, black's light squares would be extremely weak. And given that opposite color bishops generally favor the attacker in the middle game and even the end game sometimes, um, yeah, I definitely looked uh, looked forward to playing some position like this. I, I thought it would be very, very good. Um, well, I can also consider just like dropping back and putting the queen on e2 and then eventually kind of switching, um, switching the order of the pieces around so that the queen can one day show up on h7. Um, so I, I definitely thought that was uh, kind of an interesting position for me. If bishop takes f6, then I can take on e4. And let's say bishop takes b2, we can take on h7 with check. Um, and then just move the rook, or we can even take this one. And I think black's pawns here would be very, very weak, and, and white should have good chances for uh, an advantage. Um, so yeah, ultimately this just didn't feel playable. And that's why I was expecting knight to c5, just to get out of the way first where my plan would have been something like bishop to d4, um, threatening to take on d5 and win the knight, so rook c8 or something would be forced. And uh, yeah, I wasn't sure exactly how I would continue in uh, the game, but uh, the engine points out a nice resource here, starting with takes, takes, um, uh, and queen d3, with the point that white is uh, threatening to take and just win this a6 pawn. So if black castles, for example, takes, takes, queen takes a6, and uh, this would be, uh, yeah, difficult endgame for black, even though we have opposite color bishops. Um, here white has a uh, passed a pawn, and the bishop on c5 is kind of a target. After rook c7, white can start, like, doubling, uh, bringing the second rook to c1. And, yeah, basically white has an extra pawn and some pressure, so definitely a, a big advantage there. As it happened, uh, my opponent ends up playing knight c3, which I was surprised by because I didn't think... Black's position was like so critical that he has to just give a pawn up. I thought knight c5 is going to happen and then, you know, black should be able to defend somehow, but definitely a lot of game left to play. But, you know, I think knight c3 is probably uh, probably the best decision here. And um, credit to my opponent for like, you know, choosing the right moment to, to bail out. I think another reason I wasn't expecting this move is, of course, you know, after white um, takes and, and wins this pawn... We get a position where like only white can can play for the win. White plays for two results, and my opponent, being the higher rated player, basically gives up all of his winning chances to go into this. But I think he correctly realized that if he doesn't do this now, then his position might get really difficult, and you know he might end up just losing the game without any chances anyway. So kind of a mature decision to just like sack the pawn and give himself a position where he has uh, really good drawing chances. Because, uh, well, I take on d5, I take on c3. We go for this endgame, black plays bishop b4, rook c6, and a5. And compared to the previous endgame where black's pawn was on b4, here black has a much more solid construction. Bishop on b4, pawn on a5, and my extra pawn on the queen side is actually not worth very much at all, because it's just impossible to make a pass pawn. This is just a super uh, solid construction. If one day I could like sack an exchange for the bishop and pawn and then get two pawns you know, moving up the board, that would be quite nice, but that's very difficult uh, to organize. You know, I have to put both rooks on the B file, for example, and then take. But in the meantime, Black will play rook C8, you know, rook C2, and create uh, his own counterplay. So originally, I thought like, okay, White should have good chances to at least you know press here and do something. Um, but once we got to this position, you know, I started looking at it, and I just yeah couldn't really find like anything uh, reasonable to do here. Uh, the engine suggests f4, and f first gives white a, a big advantage. But if you just play human moves for black, for example, g6, and you know, let's say bishop d3, as suggested by stockfish and castles, um, king f2, rook d8, king e2, let's say black goes uh, rook b8 here. Uh, basically, white doesn't really have such a great way to uh, improve the position. Um, I can try uh, g4, for example, but then bishop a3, and... Uh, I have to defend this one. If I put my bishop on b5, then it's not really supporting the f5 push anymore. Um, and at one point, black is going to play d4 and just try to open things up and, and get some counterplay of his own. 
And so long story short, it, it's actually, it feels like more of a symbolic advantage for white. Like the engine gives something like plus one, but I think that's mainly having to do with white having an extra pawn in the position. But from a practical point of view, very difficult to actually make anything of the extra pawn. So it's one of those positions where, you know, the engine just gives like plus one after basically any move, but like there's no way to improve the position. So there's no way to actually increase the advantage. So it's kind of just like, again, more of a symbolic edge rather than anything. In the game, I ended up playing rook fc1. It just looked like the most natural move. Black castled. I played bishop to b5. Uh, and now a really accurate move, rook ad8. Threatening to just push d4 and open up the d file and get some counterplay uh, for black. Once this happens, my e5 pawn will always be kind of a weakness to watch out for. You know, I don't really want to push like f4 in this kind of position because then uh, then the f4 pawn will be weak and, and black will uh, definitely get uh, some counterplay there. Um, so I started thinking and I just yeah couldn't really find a way to stop this plan other than the move rook to d1. But this move allows black to play rook to c8. And if I let black you know take on c6 and play rook c8 and get the c file, again I don't see white having any advantage there when the rook comes into c3. I'm just going to have to go passive and defend. Um, so after yeah spending some time trying to figure out some way of continuing the game, I end up just deciding to repeat rook dc1, rook ad8, rook d1. We repeated a few more times and uh, yeah, eventually just agreed to a draw. Um, and at this point, actually, it's it becomes pretty clear that white just has no way of really uh, doing anything in the position. Black is either just getting the c file or getting d4 in. And for me, I just have no good targets. You know, my one target in the position would be f7 but it's very difficult to organize an attack there because the bishop would essentially have to somehow reach this um, e8 square. So a bit disappointing that I wasn't able to put uh, more pressure in this game after having like, you know, really nice opening and kind of uh, catching the opponent in some prep. But I think the critical moment comes back uh, to this point where, yeah, I really should have just gone for this pawn sacrifice, just taken my chances with this one. This was the way to really put the most pressure on black as possible. And uh, well, okay, hopefully I will remember this idea for the next time. Uh, that's gonna wrap it up for this video, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you haven't subbed to the channel, please do, I guess. And I'll be uh, back with the final round from the 2021 National Open. Uh, until next time, take care.